Welcome to the Mentors and Moguls podcast. I'm your host, Heather Stone. I bring you mentors and moguls from all around the world, different walks of life, from creatives to CEOs, to business leaders, to top athletes, and all kinds of other people in between. If you like our episode today, all of our podcasts are available on our YouTube channel. Please go ahead and subscribe and comment. We'd love to hear your feedback. Today, we're here in Tribeca in New York with Linda Ensko. She is the founder of Buckle My Shoe Preschool. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Heather. I have a lot to talk to you about today. Uh, First of all, I absolutely love being in this environment. What you can't see is that we're surrounded by children napping, children playing, children coloring, and children really getting creative and involved. And they're all about as tall as my knee, so I absolutely love this. But we'll try and stick to you for the moment and interview you. Tell us a little bit about when you discovered your passion and how did you exactly figure out to take your passion and turn it into a preschool? Okay. Um, well, I was 10 years old. I was very young when I discovered I loved young children. My mom was an educator and she taught me how to love and nurture and teach young children. Um, and so I was the youngest in the family. I have two older sisters. We each two years apart. We played and enjoyed growing up in nature in Long Island and Glen Cove. And um, I graduated with a degree in child development, which is psychology and education. And I went ahead to teach second grade in a private school. And unfortunately, I had 38 seven-year-olds by myself. Oh, wow. And so it was a very overwhelming task because obviously the group should have been 20 or 25. And not every child is on page three or 15, or you have another child that's on page 65. So um, after three years of having this overcrowded classroom, and it was really top down, which means children know nothing and they're fed information. Um, That's not how children learn through rote and memorization. So I was walking in the village. Uh, After college, I moved to the West Village. And I saw little children around a round table that were having a birthday party with their hats on. They were about 20 months. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can do this. And I founded the space and put up flyers. And I talked my sister into coming into the business with me, uh, my middle sister, I'm the baby. And uh, we started Buckle My Shoe with about seven or eight two-year-olds. Um, so, uh, we didn't require them to be toilet trained because it doesn't happen at 2.3 or 2.6 or 2.8. It happens when a child is ready. And in any of these areas of development, uh, really come naturally, very organically when they learn from other children. Um, they, you don't ever have to tell a child what they don't know. They're very keen observers and they watch their friends and they want to be just like their friends. Mm -hmm. So if their friend is a great artist or my daughter had a friend in March, that she turned five and they become representational artists by then. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to be just like Regina, but her birthday wasn't until August. Mm -hmm. So I said, keep on practicing. And sure enough, she became, she mastered the art of the self portrait with every eyelash, every piece of hair. And that was three months before she turned five. Oh my goodness. Because she was inspired by another child. This is really good to know. I never really thought of it that way. Yeah, Um, they learn so much from each other. They really love being together. And I think our hardest part is the end of the day when mom or dad comes in and they run into the pre-K room where the big kids are, the four and five-year-olds, and they want to see the bunny, and then they don't want to leave. Mm. So uh, they just have so much fun here, and learning is really about them. It's not about the standards. Mm -hmm. It's so joyful. Mm -hmm. And it's very unlike when I went to school, because as I taught second grade with 38 for three years, little seven-year-olds, I was a product of 54 children. I was the youngest in the class, and there was one teacher. Wow. So for eight years, uh, I did not like school. And then I went to high school in Manhasset, and I was a senior, and the teacher said, you can pick a course. And I said, what? I can actually choose what I'm learning? I might go to college. And of course, I was going to college. Right. Um, but uh, it just, the research supports that unless the child has a voice, in learning that it often the information goes in and out. Mm. You know, as an adult, when you use something, you are able to retain it. 
If you don't use it, you usually lose it. That's right. And it's the same thing with top-down education, having children memorize and wrote. It's not about them. I'm sure you remember when you were in school mm -hmm. and you did a special science project or you were in theater and it was just that special moment that was really about you. Right. Those are your memories. So I noticed that you love to teach the whole child. That's very important here. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, I know there's a few other schools that I've come across that have that same approach, but it's not universal. Um, why don't we have that here? And is that really the best way to teach that you think for, for children to really develop? Right. Well, it's really the whole child is really respecting the child. And at, at the, in the Netherlands, they've been doing early childhood very, very well for about 50 years. Right. Um, here, uh, a lot of, um, I want to say, probably parents feel like the child needs to be reading and writing by age three or four. Right. The brain is not really designed to read until they're closer to six. Oh. And actually, when they did studies in France, they taught them at five. And in the Netherlands, when they were eight, when they did the comprehension studies when they were 10, of course, the children that started later and had a better foundation were better readers. Really? So it's really about Ned Potter from NBC News said, at Buckle My Shoe, they do the right thing at the right time. And so really building the foundation of where the child is, getting to know themselves through the world around them including the parents. In early childhood, it's very, very important for the parents to be part. So we've always had an open door policy of parents coming in, sharing their talents and passions, and of course, um, enjoying this time. Because when they're adolescents, according to Bank Street, where my degree is, Bank Street College, at eight or 10, they start the pushback thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have a new haircut, a new pair of glasses. Uh, let me meet your teacher and your friends when they were in fourth grade. No, I'm good. Drop me off outside the yard, right. please, mom. Right, please. Right. So now there's a time when they celebrate you. They love you. And they want you to be part of their life here in school. They want to share this with you. And we do that in many ways. We have a private Instagram account for our parents okay. and their relatives. Okay. And we have grandparents in Brazil that know when they come to visit a few times a year. We already know. We watch it every day. And then we have blogs and we have um, children's higher thinking, mm -hmm. which is really their portfolios. It's not the ERB they're going to take to get into kindergarten sure. or the private school. It's really about their day-to-day -day work. And we do uh, uh, advise to parents that they, they use the portfolios for admissions into the private schools. Right. Um, but it really is a window of how a child learns. Uh, we use a very good consultant, Dr. George Foreman. He's mm -hmm. not the grill man. Mm -hmm. He's a PhD <laughs> from UMass Amherst. Yes. He was there for over 30 years. He's been our consultant for close to 20 years. Mm. And he says, at Buckle My Shoe, children have to think a little harder. Wow. It's really getting them to be independent thinkers. Right. And coming up, if you give them the answer, then you take away their aha moment. If you ask the right question, which is Dr. Foreman's article, right. they often can come up with an answer and then they own that. And that's building a child's self-esteem mm -hmm. by having them independent, to be independent thinkers, to learn how to collaborate, communicate, and to have empathy. That's very, very important. Mm. We do all kinds of fundraisers for, you know, if they have old blankets, they wash them and they give them to the dog shelter. Now they're going to be making toys for the dogs, the four to five-year-olds, um, and donating that. But it's really about the giving component. We're raising um uh, food for the drive for the holidays. Uh, we've done winter coats before. I mean, really teaching them that some people have less and it'd be really, really important to help them. Right. So you're raising socially conscious children from really from, yeah, two years young. old. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. So question for you. So any young new mothers that might be watching and they're evaluating, where do I send my child? It would be wonderful if your school was in every city and you, you could take everyone. But well, as I parents see- Parents have asked me that. That's right. Two is enough for me because it's not really a business. It's more about the personal aspect of me being an educator and getting to know the children and the parents. Right. Parents have asked me to do schools in Westchester and New Jersey and Connecticut and all over the country. I'm sure. But I, I'm, I'm a hands-on person. I'm an educator that likes to know the community. So what would you say, what are maybe three qualities that a young mother or father should look for when they're choosing a school um, to really give their, their son or ch uh, daughter a great platform for learning from the very beginning? 
Well, it's very important when you go into a school that you hear the energy right? and you hear the children's voices. As the woman who helped me find my first space in 1981 for the health department said, you know, whenever she was our consultant for 25 years, she said, whenever I come into your school, I don't hear teachers' voices. I hear children's voices. Oh, And so really about happy children's voices, children that are engaged. Our children, when the tours come through, moms and dads for next year, um, they look out up for them and they say hello. They're very friendly. They love new people. Mm. They're specialists that come once a week and they're outside professionals in their Mm -hmm. field. So whether they're musicians or dancers, uh, super soccer's, karate, they love when these special people come in. So they're they're special friends that come in uh, throughout the week in order to really enhance their learning experience Mm -hmm. at the school. And a place that is warm, Mm -hmm. you know, you can have a PhD in education, but the children won't ask for you if you don't come back if you're not warm. So it's very important to be warm and loving and nurturing. Um, And a school that's going to include you in early childhood, that's very important for parents to be included as part of the experience. Uh, I think that's very valuable uh, advice for any young parents that are out there. So thank you for sharing. Well, let's go back a little bit. I know that you've got um, you've got a secession plan. Perhaps your daughter is also who I met, who is beautiful and very smart and talented. So your daughter is here as well. So you've got a unique kind of a business situation. You're a business. Uh, You obviously uh, welcome everyone with love and caring. That's very apparent the minute we walk in here. Um, is your hope that your daughter will follow in your footsteps or do you think she'll do something else? What's your, what's your plan for the future? I would hope that she, she would, if, if that's what her passion is, right? Because, um, it's very important for us to all follow our passions. Yes. And this was my passion. Yes. Um, she was here since she was born. And in, back in the day, she's 29 now, <clears throat> we didn't have infants. So mm-hmm. she emulated all her behavior with two-year-olds. Mm-hmm. So she was crawling at four months, walking at eight months. And when she come from kindergarten in the neighborhood, she came and took care of the one and two-year-olds. Mm-hmm. So it, this was a natural uh, passion for her young children. Um, but she also has a number of other passions. Sure. So it, it, I would really just want her to be happy. That would be, you know, that's what I want for my children. And my alumni have come back and said, these were their happiest when they brought their children here. These were their happiest years when it was really about them and they could learn at the pace that they needed. And uh, they were really respected. And um, education was really about them. It wasn't about the standards. What a testament to your school. You must be very proud of, of everything that you've built. Um, if someone wanted to come along and say, this is a phenomenal idea. Uh, I love your approach. It's a little bit different. Uh, and they've had it with the standard school situation and what, what that has to offer. Um, and they said, I would like to open up my own school, maybe to emulate what you've done. Um, what would they do first? What, what, path would they take or what path do you advise them to take if they wanted to follow in your footsteps to some degree? Well, they have to love children. Yes. When I interview teachers, it's not, I like children. Mm -hmm. I love them. Mm -hmm. And they have to be prepared to be very, very hard workers. Yes. uh, Because it takes a long time to develop a really good school. Mm. The experts say it takes at least five years. Really? uh, Whether it's elementary or, you know, you have to work out a lot of problems in the beginning of running a business. Um, And for for teachers, we don't really have a background in business. Right. So it's kind of like learning by the seat of your pants, so to speak, and marketing and learning all these areas. And the parents right from the beginning have been so supportive because they see how happy their children are. Mm -hmm. So they really support, you know, the school. And uh, we did in many, many barterings. Of course, we needed to pay our teachers. Right. Um, but with art, because we had many artists down here in Tribeca and in the West Village. Um, but they were just so happy that their children wanted to come to school and were learning so much that um, that's a huge connection to have the parents support you. Um, and also money. When you're starting a small business, we're not a corporation. Right. Uh, we're not supported as you know, some child care centers by corporations. Right. Uh, it's a mom and pop operation. And now what's happening in child care is 
they're coming, you know, from Florida and they're starting five schools. Right. Um, but we started very slowly with seven children with a long wait list because I was 26, my sister was 28, and the parents were well in their 40s in right. the village. So we work with educational psychologists for many years to really learn how to work with children, how to work with parents. Of course, a degree in psychology was very helpful as well. I bet. I bet. Um, share with us a story, if you will. I just just a couple of sentences about um, the financial piece and how things maybe have changed. And it's not easy about when you wanted to go get some financial backing in the very beginning and some lessons that you learned or maybe some rude awakenings. Well, I had some money. It was a very small amount. Um, and my father, uh, it was from an accident and my father said, you have to put this away. Mm -hmm. So I put it away until I was 26 mm -hmm. and, um, we were on a shoestring budget. My husband did a lot of the construction. Uh, we had our fingers stuck together with the, uh, soundproof tiles uh -huh. because it's very heavy duty glue. And we worked really hard, uh, just 12 hours a day on weekends to get the school ready to start in September. We signed the lease in, in July. And then um, we stayed very small. We paid ourselves minimal mm -hmm. amount. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as we were able to hire another educator, we did, and then specialists. Um, and I went to the First Woman's Bank in, in thoughts that perhaps they would support a woman-owned business. And they said, well, you can have a loan if you have 100% collateral. And I said, well, why would I be coming to see you if I, if I had 100% <laughs> collateral? So they didn't really support women back in 1981. Right. And um, uh, so, you know, it was just about uh, whenever you're in business, you have to be very resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, financially, you go through ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the 90s is parents moved to the suburbs. Mm. So we had working parents. And mm -hmm. down here, of course, we had the courts. We right. had DOT, Department of Transportation, upstairs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we had the long hours, um, uh, right. but they commuted with their children. Right. And then after September 11th, the community still stayed pretty strong mm. and, um, parents were flocking to the neighborhood right. from the Upper West Side, et cetera, et right. cetera. So Tribeca has become very trendy. Mm -hmm. I think it was the highest zip code in the country about five years ago. Mm. Um, but the parents really love this area because there's a lot of open air space mm -hmm. and we have beautiful parks with grass and a gazebo. That's one of the reasons why I started the school here. Okay. A parent was coming from Tribeca up to the West Village and she said, you know, I have this loft down here. She said, maybe you want to start a school down here. And I lived in Independence Plaza right. and it was a mud hole. So mm. when I came down and saw grass in the gazebo, the way I grew up with grass under my feet in Long Island, I said, I want to start a school here. Mm. So we had a smaller space for about four years. And then one of our dads was a real estate lawyer. And he said, I'm going to get you this bank space. I'm going to speak to Jeff Garrell, the owner of Newmark. Mm. He said, I'll get it for mm. you. 8,500 square feet on the avenue. A little preschool. Unheard How can we of. afford that? Right. So Jeff has been the most amazing landlord. Mm. He gave us scholarships for the workers upstairs. He gave me money for renovation. I stood on the line here. These were teller windows once a week or really? twice a week. Really? This was our bank, Buckle My Shoe Bank. Oh my and goodness. And we started with three months, which is the imprint, the most important time in our life, according to psychologists, it's the first five years. So serendipitous, we don't remember most of it, but it's who we are. Wow. So zero to three is, of course, the fastest in brain development. So to be able to have the component of infants here, mm -hmm. three months up to two years, the infant toddler, and then two to five and a half, it's, you need a very large space because right. a child under one, you have to have a separate nap room. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy for most programs because you're not licensed for the nap room. So in, it, essentially you're paying rent on the space where they sleep, but you have no income. Otherwise it's 30 square feet per child. Um, and you know what New York rents are. But as I said, with our landlord, Jeff Gorell, it's been almost 30 years. He sent his grandchildren to me on 13th Street. Oh, my goodness. So he's been so supportive. He's really been our friend. And I have a wonderful landlord at 13th Street, Marty Zelnick. He's a teacher of architecture, retired mm -hmm. from FIT. And we've been with him. He's my friend for almost 38 years. So we're very, very lucky. We have wonderful landlords that really support uh, our mission here with young children. Wow. Wow. What would be something that you would say um, to maybe your 27 year old self looking back? What would you tell your 27 year old self? Any words of advice now that you know what you know? Be resilient, 
hang in there. Right. My mother always says, do not perseverate. You know, just it's going to work out. Very positive. She would see a glass that was almost empty and say it was full. So just really work on the positive um, and really work together. We're a very strong community. Our teachers, I tell them, it's not about competition. Mm. We're about collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's the way the world has become. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the 80s, it was all about the solo act. Yes. And then in the 90s, the banks started to merge. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. um, but if you didn't have good communication skills, if you didn't have good people skills, you weren't going to do well in business or probably in personal uh, area of life. So it's really, we hired a, a teacher from Harvard mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And I said, you know what? We're not about competition. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, I know I can do this. And she was an amazing teacher. So it's really about them trusting each other. I have over 30 teachers. Mm -hmm. They collaborate, they share, they talk about the children, uh, about their thinking process and documentation, which is making learning visible. Mm -hmm. um, and really uh, the videos, the pictures, they all need time for this. So we give our teachers two hours in the afternoon. They only do about eight or 10 portfolios in the morning. A lot mm -hmm. of schools have morning and afternoon. So they're doing 20 portfolios. You're not gonna have the quality right. that our teachers have because they have the time to reflect. Mm -hmm. And according to John Dewey, Piaget and Dr. George Foreman, it's not in the moment. You know, when you say something or do something, you stop and you reflect. Next time I'll say it this way. Next time I'll do it this way. That's right. And so for young children, they should be given lots of opportunities to revisit, not repetition, reflection. Mm -hmm. And the teachers have that two hours in the afternoon to do documentation, to do communication um, and really share of what the next step will be. We don't do one morning meeting. We do a morning meeting to talk about yesterday and then we do a reflection meeting before lunch so we can talk about what we did that day. Highly unusual, but obviously highly effective because I know you have waiting lists around the block uh, and then some. So I, I wish my children could have come to a school like this. I, I wish, wish I could have my shoe. Yes. I, I didn't go I to could've. school till kindergarten. So, wow. you know, back in the day, five-year-olds, yes. I was always with mommy. Yes. Yeah. Did yes. you go to preschool? I didn't. Oh. My mom was busy. My, my, my brothers and sisters went, but I did mm -hmm. not go. She was just too busy. Yeah. So I stayed with mom, which okay. was great. But yes, mm -hmm. very different, different. Children become so independent at this age and they really have a place. Their play is their work mm -hmm. and they see mommy and daddy go to work and then they want to be with their friends and they want to be working here. And it's just a very positive experience for them. So for lifelong learning, uh, really important. You start them early. Um, and um, they're just so happy together. Interesting question for you. Is there a difference between the way you teach boys versus girls or maybe how they used to do it and how they do it now? Or is it all the same? Do you have a different approach? No, we, we have the boys and the girls together mm -hmm. and they make their choices mm -hmm. in their play, particularly when they're four and a half and five, they tell you exactly what they want to do because they're pros at it at that time. Right. Um, but it, it's funny back in 1981, do you remember the little golden books? Yes. Well, oh, yes. Well, one of them was we help mommy yes. and mommy's in the kitchen mm -hmm. and the parents in 1981 were like, you can't read that book to the children because that they're, they're, they're equal. You know, maybe, maybe dad's in the kitchen cooking and maybe mom's out in the yard. Right. So right from the beginning, we had equality, you know, and having children choose what they, what they wanted to do. Uh, how they wanted to work, what materials. The boys love dress up as much as the girls. Right. You know, right. Uh, so it's really about um, about equality. And they learn that very early here. So you fostered their sense of self from the minute they oh, walked right in from here. the beginning. Love and, that. you know, by putting all their pictures up around the school mm -hmm. and their work, it builds their self-esteem mm -hmm. because you're saying to them, I'm so proud of what you did. Right. And they can see that. Would you like to speak to the fact that anxiety and pressure and working in groups uh, with a certain age group seems to be the norm? Um, do you do anything here that kind of guides the children or sets them up for independence more than any other school? I think by having children in small groups mm -hmm. and giving them individualized attention, mm -hmm. that it's very important for building their self-esteem. Oh, okay. Children get into conflict Impulse control doesn't really set in until a child is six. Hmm. So when they're out in the yard with 200 children and two adults, things right. can get a little messy. Right. Or in the cafeteria 
Uh, they never eat their food because no one's there to help them say, okay, take another bite. You know, they talk to their friends because they're not allowed to talk in class. Mm. So here they get a lot of individualized attention. And of course, we're not all doing the same thing at the same time. Right. We work in small groups, which is very regio and developmental. And so some children will be playing and perhaps in the dress up corner and other children will be doing their self portraits and looking at themselves and realizing, hmm, I don't have a belly button because they usually get the head, the arms and the legs and there's no torso. And then they all start putting the torso in and that can be closer to four and five when they become representational artists. Mm. Uh, but it's very unusual. Sometimes I see it in a two year old room where the child has the full torso, the whole body. Huh. Uh, so they're very keen observers. They watch each other. They learn from each other. And each group is divided by every six to eight months. So developmentally, they're getting the support that they need. How you talk to a two-year-old is very different than how you talk to a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. My teachers have masters in early childhood. Um, and in the infant rooms, they have two-year degrees. Or we do a lot of in-house training with the, with the top specialists, Dr. George Foreman and Reggio Consultants. And it's really about higher level thinking for the teachers as well. Right. The more you work with young children, the more you realize you need to know. You right. want to know more. It's just when you become expert in your field, you keep on studying Right. because things change. In education, things change every 10 years. And I think we're at a really good place mm -hmm. in education because I think it's a balance of some structure, but also some openness. Mm -hmm. um, and the child does have a voice in what they're learning in most of the good schools. Mm. So let's talk about the digital age. So when I was going to school, quite obviously, we didn't have all things digital, but now it's very common for me to see uh, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old at the dinner table, out at a restaurant or in their stroller, and they're you know, swiping and they're on an iPad or they're on an iPhone. How do you feel about children using technology at a very young age? I feel that children, um, it's very important. Uh, it's funny you said about the swiping because I had a PhD student and he realized a couple of years ago that children don't know how to turn pages. They know how to swipe. That's right. So um, it's very important for children to learn through sensory integration. That's how the synapses in, in the brain spark. Okay. So they can't look and listen like we as adults. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to smell, to feel. The twos are very motoric. They have to move. I taught mm -hmm. them for six years in order to learn. Mm -hmm. So you can't have a child. A child doesn't learn from a flat screen. Mm -hmm. A child learns by doing. And uh, Bank Street has had courses of four-year-olds with computers and not. It's gone back and forth. But I always tell parents, once they learn, my children learned in kindergarten, they're never going to put it down. Right. And as teenagers, you're not going to be able to put a child in a sandbox. Right. Because the sensory integration has to happen now when they're young. So it's sand, it's water, it's clay, it's paint. Yeah. Well, we're talking about technology and iPads and children using iPads. Is it a good idea to let them use iPads at a young age or does that change their growth behavior, their growth pattern? I think that it's very important for children to be working in sensory integration, mm -hmm. which is using all their senses, not just their eyes or their ears. Um, and they learn from, from people. They don't right. learn from a flat screen. Right. So it, it, they're playing in the sandbox. They're playing with the clay. They're playing in the water. That's how children learn. That's how the neurons in their brains are sparked. Mm -hmm. uh, not by looking at TV, which really shouldn't, shouldn't start with a child until they're closer to three. Mm -hmm. It's not good for brain development. And it's the same with the computer. Mm -hmm. um, Google did a study... Um, and they believe in the Waldorf school, which is very similar to the Reggio Amelia, bringing nature and having children grow with nature. And they do not introduce iPads to children until they're in eighth grade when they're 13. So and these are the tech geniuses. The experts are not allowing their children on computers until they're older. So brain development starts with children being engaged and and touching things and smelling things and moving and um, all their senses. It's not looking and listening. They can't learn that way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So all you young mothers and fathers out there that are listening, listen to what she's saying. Google doesn't even let their children use iPads and computers until a certain age. 
That's fascinating. And I did not know that. Yeah. What is something that you can do at home to best help your child develop? Because I think the one crutch that all of us parents have used is turn on a show, turn on the cartoons and let that be your babysitter. That is the modern day babysitter. Um, we're doing a lot of damage or we're, we're hindering their growth by doing that, aren't we? Yes. I, you know, we come from an era where you had three, four children in a house and they were all playmates, usually often close together. Yes. Um, and they didn't need TV. My mom never let me watch TV mm -hmm. when I was young. She said, go outside. We have yep. lots of grass and trees and lots of children on the block right. and play. So I learned how to communicate. I learned how to collaborate. I love nature. Mm -hmm. And she knew TV was not not the right thing for young children. Right. And now, unfortunately, you know, it's a latch key children that go come home from school. They look on their iPads, they play video games and they don't have that connection. Right. And it's, it's very, very important to have that. Right. Um, and, you know, coming to school and having a routine and uh, being with educators um, and learning is so important at this age. Mm -hmm. They should not be isolated. Mm -hmm. They need to be together. They love to be together. If you go out to dinner with your husband and you leave one child, they'll often cry. But if you have another child there as a playmate, they'll be happy. They right. have a friend with them. Right. So uh, it's very important, the socialization, and um, not to have them on the iPads until they're older. And once they're five and they learn all of this, as my children learned when they were five, they never put it down. Right. So right. they are not going to be in the sandbox when they're 13 years old. Right. Uh, they'll have skipped that stage of sensory integration. Now I hear music in the, the background. I know it's nap time, so it's yeah. very soothing. We all love music to, to relax to. Is music a part of your development, your early development as well? Yes, music and art. And actually, I'm very interested in working with some scientists at various universities. I'm starting with playing classical music, when not when they sleep when they work. Hmm. So when they paint and you put on classical music, they have a very different thought process. John Hopkins School of Education said it definitely increases their focus oh. when they line up. When you play it, they're calmer than fidgeting and falling and pulling. Hmm. And even when babies are starting to eat, if they see one bottle of food, the other ones want to have it at the same time. When you play the kid music, they just start to whine and cry. And when you play the classical, they just start thinking and they're calmer. Hmm. So classical music is really important for brain development in the young years. And I'm very surprised that no preschools really do this. So it's an area I'm always interested in brain development and research and really how to support the child's learning. Interesting. Does that work on adults too? I know we're already developing. Probably. With our I habits, think they but... do say when you study or when you really want to focus to have it on in the background is important. Okay. Right. I'm going to try that. Okay. Every, every little bit helps. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So one of the questions that I love to ask people is, given what you know now, what would you say that you would do less of looking back on your life in your career that you could do without? What would you do less of? that didn't serve you on your pathway to building this beautiful school in your, in your career? I guess probably not taking my advice by worry. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a small business and you're an entrepreneur, you have to take a lot of risks. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't take those risks, then you don't have growth. You don't have change. And I, I, I think it's the responsibility um, that was difficult. I was taught very young how to be responsible, obviously at 10 years old, mother's helper because right. mom stayed home. Dad's right. went to work on the block. Um, and, um, as I've become older, I've become more confident, um, and, and less worrisome because it, it doesn't pay to perseverate. Right. It's much better to be positive. Right. And what do you wish you would have done more or had more of growing up in your career? If I could have had more of, or if I could have done more of blank, what would that be? Speaking to your younger self. Probably in my career, mm -hmm. well, I was very lucky as a mother to be able to bring my children to work. Yes, you were. So I got to see them grow up, mm -hmm. but I probably would have liked to have a little more free time with my children. Mm -hmm. Not to say I'd be a stay-at-home mom because my 
children were my schools when I built them. Right. I waited till I was 35 to have my child. Mm -hmm. So I was taking care of other people's children for many, many years. And I said, wow, you're getting a little old here. You have to start thinking about having your own children. Right. Uh, but probably just to have more time. You know, they were in school. And of course, it was difficult doing two jobs at once, the child and parents and the other children and the teachers, of course. Right. Um, but probably having a little bit more downtime. It was very difficult uh, starting a business. And for many, many years, because as I said, the demographics changed in New York and uh, it was just about being resilient. I love it. Well, I appreciate your time and sharing your story with us. And I know that the, all of the, the young mothers and mothers of all ages are watching, even grandmothers are watching, because uh, I've learned uh, quite a few things about early childhood development. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for tuning into the Mentors and Moguls podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, rate and review this interview and share it with a friend who could benefit from today's guest. You can find bonus video episodes at mentorsandmogulspodcast.com. Or check out our events page and our blog at heatherrstone.com. Until next time, make it a great day.